Welcome back, mitochondriacs. It's Dr. Peebler again. Have you ever wondered how mitochondrial DNA heteroplasmy, mitochondrial dysfunction, and cancer are linked? Have you ever wanted to know what causes your young, functional, and healthy mitochondria to become transformed into diseased, dysfunctional, and old mitochondria? Have you ever wondered how mutant mitochondria are related to the Warburg effect and cancer? Well, you're in luck because that is exactly what we're going to be discussing today. Okay, let's jump into this. We're talking about how a healthy, young, functional mitochondria is going to be transformed formed into an old, damaged, dysfunctional, diseased mitochondria. As you can see here, these cristae are in line, they are laminar, and they are organized. These are our health-promoting, health-maintaining mitochondria. However, as mitochondria age, they become less organized, the cristae don't line up and are more disorganized, and as we'll talk about in the near future, the cristae organization and shape directly determines function and super complex formation. So when you see vacuolated, disorganized mitochondria like this, this is showing you this is an old, damaged, and disease-promoting mitochondria. So when we are young, unless we're born with an inherited mitochondrial disease or mitochondrial dysfunction, and yes, since we get our mitochondria from our mother, it's possible that she can pass down heteroplasmy mitochondria at birth. That is how transgenerational epigenetics works, how you can inherit certain diseases. Now, most of us are not going to be given diseased mitochondria at birth to the point where we have childhood diseases, although those do exist. But as we talk about mitochondrial heteroplasmy, we're talking about acquired mitochondrial DNA mutations that affect mitochondrial performance, bioenergetics, and overall cellular health. So as we can see here, we have healthy, relatively healthy mitochondria. And in these cases, we're going to be asymptomatic of a disease because we're going to have normal or highly functional mitochondrial respiration or oxidative phosphorylation, OxFos. However, as certain populations of cells, and this is why you can de develop a disease in one part of your body and not in another, because this is not a homogeneous process. You can have high heteroplasmy in one part of your body, which manifests the disease, and normal or more normal mitochondrial heteroplasmy or lower mitochondrial heteroplasmy in another part of your body, which still functions adequately. Ultimately, this is what leads to death for humans, because at some point, all of your mitochondria in every part of your body is dysfunctional, and you hit a threshold of the entire organism and you end up with systemic diseases and ultimately demise. But essentially what happens is you hit a certain threshold where maybe 70% or in some cases 100% are mutated mitochondria, which are dysfunctional, which do not produce ATP like they're designed to. They overproduce reactive oxygen species and then the patient becomes symptomatic. This is a sick disease mitochondria. So mitochondria have their own DNA. We've discussed that fairly recently. And that DNA is located in the mitochondrial matrix, the same location where a lot of mitochondrial biochemical reactions are happening, such as the TCA cycle. The DNA structure is cyclical. It's not linear like the nuclear DNA, and it's much smaller. As a matter of fact, in humans, mitochondrial DNA only has about 16,500 base pairs, which is a very small fraction of what DNA in the nucleus contains. However, there are many copies. Each mitochondrial circular DNA contains 37 genes 13 of which encode for mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation proteins. This is what the mitochondrial DNA looks like graphically. So because there are more than one copy of DNA, in fact, there are hundreds, if not thousands of copies of mitochondrial DNA in a single mitochondrion, that allows for something to happen called heteroplasmy. And heteroplasmy makes mitochondrial diseases more complex and heterogeneous than you would expect. And mitochondrial associated dysfunction plays an important role in the development of multi-systemic primary mitochondrial disease, neurodegeneration, and cancer. And today, I'm going to try to make that link from mitochondrial DNA heteroplasmy to cancer. From this paper, mitochondrial heteroplasmy exists as a dynamic, determined co-expression of inherited polymorphisms and somatic mutations in varying ratios within individual mitochondrial DNA genomes with repetitive patterns of tissue specificity. Mechanistically, carcinogenic cellular processes include profound operations of normal mitochondrial function, notably dependent on aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis, and aberrant production and release of lactate according to classic theory. So this paper was written in 2016, and what it's doing is, is it's laying the groundwork for a paper that came out just a couple months ago in March of 2024. Basically, what they're finding is, is the mitochondrial DNA mutants, high heteroplasmid disease mitochondria, depend on aerobic glycolysis, and they have aberrant production and release of lactate. Now, if you will remember from not too long ago that normal cells are going to have some amount of glucose, a small amount of 
of lactate, glucose will get transferred into the TCA cycle, as well as some small amount of glutamine, and that's going to power our cells through the electron transport chain to make ATP normally. However, under the Warburg metabolic reprogramming, we know that there's about 30 times more glucose consumed. There are orders of magnitude higher levels of lactate, which, remember, contributes to the tumor microenvironment, and there are 10 to 30 times more use of glutamine in abnormal damaged mitochondria participating in the Warburg effect. And that's exactly what these authors were setting up back in 2016. That what they were seeing was very similar and in parallel to what the researchers are studying cancer biology were seeing is that these mitochondria that are dysfunctional depend on the Warburg metabolism to somewhat stay alive because they're so dysfunctional. They're so heteroplasmated. They're so damaged. So essentially, we have environmental factors that directly affect oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation, when it's interrupted or damaged, is is going to lead to the accumulation of mitochondrial DNA mutations. That's going to lead to a snowball effect of progressive energetic decline because as these 37 genes that make up the mitochondrial DNA are damaged, the 13 essential mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation proteins will then also become dysfunctional, which will lead to a progressive decline in the bioenergetic output or ATP output or energy output from mitochondria, which then leads to downstream diseases that have been talked about during other videos that I have posted on mitochondrial heteroplasmy. But since we're talking about cancer in this particular video, it leads to the initiation, promotion, and contributes to metastases within cancer. So this is a paper by Doug Wallace, the man who was on the previous slide, a lead mitochondrial researcher. And it says, since the mitochondria use oxidative phosphorylation, oxphos, to convert dietary calories into usable energy, generating reactive oxygen species as a toxic byproduct, I have hypothesize that mitochondrial dysfunction plays a central role in a wide range of age-related disorders and various forms of cancer. So remember, essentially, we have oxphos, and oxphos is on the inner mitochondrial membrane of these cristae, and mitochondrial DNA is right adjacent to that, floating around in the mitochondrial matrix, along with the TCA cycle, intermediates, and enzymes. And because oxphos, as it becomes dysfunctional, will release excess oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, and it's so adjacent to the mitochondrial DNA, it will directly damage these mitochondrial DNA. And what we see is, is we see a transition from wild type healthy mitochondria to more mutants seen in the colony of mitochondria. And ultimately, we have some threshold where the body cannot compensate for that level of mitochondrial heteroplasmy, and we develop symptoms in a disease. This is a very similar representation. In the beginning part of the video, we saw this picture, and essentially is we have blue, which is the wild type healthy mitochondria. This is when we're born, ideally. It may not be exactly like this. We may have some degree of mitochondrial heteroplasmy when we're born. However, that's how childhood diseases are at play here. Transgenerational epigenetics. However, under ideal conditions, you are born with a good colony of mitochondria in most of your tissues. And as we accumulate damage throughout our lifetime, we hit some threshold. And that threshold is when disease progresses and becomes out of control. And doesn't that look exactly like this picture? If you remember back from the cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease series, we've seen where normal mitochondria see the healthy cristae, see the normal morphology, see how it, it relies on oxidative phosphorylation. And as disease or malignancy is progressing, we see that the cancer of mitochondrion are damaged and they're not relying on oxidative phosphorylation, exactly like we see here. It's the exact same process at play. And this is the most important factor determining progression to the Warburg metabolism. Again, we have DNA damage from various oxidative stressors. We have increases in ROS or reactive oxygen species. The mitochondria that are normally shaped with normal crista formation, then become dysfunctional appearing and ultimately evacuated and essentially empty vesicles where nothing more than disease driving intermediates are formed, which then further drive the Warburg effect. We've seen this slide before in the past. This is how mitochondrial heteroplasmy and cancer are linked. I want to quickly go back to the metabolic reprogramming that happens in cancer. This in general is going to be a gradual process and will hit a threshold at some point and will become a vicious cycle. We've talked about various vicious cycles, whether it be glucose and lactate, whether it be glutamine, they all drive this Warburg metabolism even further by creating the hypoxic and pseudo-hypoxic conditions that lead to out-of-control metabolism and growth. This is another representation or another graphic we've seen in the past. We have normal amounts of glucose being converted to pyruvate, being converted to NADH and FADH2, which then are used in oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP, and you have all of the healthy mechanisms in place. However, in the cancer cell, we're bringing in 10 to 30 times more glucose. We're using 
causing that glucose to convert into lactate. We have a series of inhibitors of mitochondrial function, one of which being pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, HIF1 alpha, et cetera. And all of these built up intermediates that would normally be cleared out under normal physiology are then feeding back into biosynthesis or even contributing to HIF stabilization and the Warburg effect, which directly leads to increased proliferation and metastases. This leads us to the last and ultimate question we had at the beginning of the video. How does mitochondrial heteroplasmy relate to the Warburg metabolism seen in cancer? I give you figure A and B. These figures show what a wild type metabolism looks like versus a mutant heteroplasmid metabolism looks like. And the wild type, we're using glycolysis and using the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain as per normal. However, in the mutant mitochondria and the heteroplasmid mitochondria, we are heavily relying on glucose and glutamine, and we see a more Warburg-like metabolism. This is what leads to excess lactate formation, excess TCA cycle intermediate buildup, which then stabilizes HIF and then cascades into Warburg metabolism and the vicious snowball that happens with uncontrolled metabolism and growth. I give you the connection, the important critical link between mitochondrial heteroplasmy, cancer metabolism, cancer, and cancer metabolism. If you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. And until next time.